with a water-driven clock, the basic way to increase accuracy is, is just to make it bigger and bigger. So the great water clocks of the earlier periods in China and in uh, the Mediterranean, in, in order to acquire enormous accuracy, would have had to have been huge. Small-scale water clocks are extraordinarily inaccurate. The great advantage of the weight-driven, geared uh, clock equipped with an, with an escapement is that you can increase precision by making it simpler and smaller. And ultimately, the victory of the purely mechanical clock with weights and then with springs will be that it can be miniaturized, not only with no loss of precision, but with enormous increases of, of precision. So the superb chronometers of the 17th and 18th century, culminating in the work of Harrison and Marge and Earnshaw in 18th century England, are precise partly because they've been simplified and they've been turned very small in comparison with the great clocks of the Middle Ages. So what mechanization will give you is the ability to be precise by being simple and by being small. Already by the 13 and 1400s, you start to see in most Euro European towns, especially in Northern Europe, the emergence of groups of skilled clockmakers. And the groups of clockmakers are very much the carriers of a whole range of artisan and, and craft skills. It's not simply the ability to make superb, finely wrought clocks, which the emergence of the, of the clockmakers guarantees. In order to make those clocks, one has to pull in resources and skills from a wide variety of other trades. And it's very much around the clockmakers, just as around the spectacle makers, that we see the growth of those artisans and craftsmen who, who produce increasingly superb luxury goods, but also the techniques and resources for um, experimentation, navigation, and precision measurement. So around these new groups of artisans, that's a key place for the next te technological revolutions in Western Europe.